You know what's funny? When I was in the Cardinal team, every time we had to put on a jersey, every time before every match that we went to play, we had to put on a soccer jersey. And I remember vividly when I had to put on that jersey number 21. And I remember as soon as I put on that jersey number 21, everything changed. The, wa the way I walked changed. Usually I walked like this, but as soon as I got into the field, this is probably how I was walking. I walked like a boss. But then the thing is, it, it's all in the jersey. The secret is all in the jersey. You know, even, even my name changed from Wandile to Wonder Kid to Cristiano Ronaldo. You, you feel so great. I mean, you, you even feel like Cristiano Ronaldo. And not only do you feel like Cristiano Ronaldo, you end up playing like him. I mean, we also kind of look alike, but then the thing is, <laughs> you, you, you feel so great that you want to play like Cristiano Ronaldo, and once they give you that ball, you, you're so excited, you, you feel so great. There's, there's actually nothing impossible. They cannot stop you, they cannot hold you, just because of that jersey you put on. <laughs> just when you put that jersey and walk into that. Nothing is impossible. You can even dunk in the soccer field, amen? <laughs> That's how great it is once you put that jersey on. You know, uh, I've got a, a suit mate. His name is Kenny. How many of you know Kenny? Kenny is a cool guy. Uh, he's a quiet type and stuff. Goes to classes, does everything other students do. But the thing is, the Kenny I know as my suit mate is a different Kenny the one who also goes and plays basketball. When Kenny is in the court, he changes. He's no longer Kenny, but we call him K-Smooth. Because once he gets the ball, he, he gets aggressive. Everything changes, he, he, he goes crazy just because of that jersey. Now friends, Kenny goes crazy once he gets into the soccer field. He starts playing like LeBron James. He starts acting like LeBron James, even the way he walks, the way he sm smiles, even the way he laughs. Maybe he'll be laughing like, ha, ha, ha. It, 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 it's so different. Everything changes. But the big question is, what happens when Kenny takes out the jersey? What happens when Kenny takes out the soccer jersey? What happens when I take out the basketball jersey? What happens when I take out the soccer jersey? When I walk out of the field, what happens when I walk out of that soccer field? I'm just like any other student. I'm just another number in that God and human life list. I'm just like each and every one of you. I still have to stand in that long gazebo line. I go back to being Wandile. I go, Kenny goes back to being Kenny from K-Smooth. You know what's funny though? When we enter into the Sabbath hours, when we, when we enter into church, we put on that holy jersey number seven. Everyone gets excited. As you enter into the UV, everyone is like, Sabbath hug. <laughs> everyone is filled with the Spirit. Everyone is filled with joy. Everyone is just loving it. I mean, they sing their lungs out. People play the guitar. People sit on the pews. Everything is just so great and perfect. You forget about your problems. All you think about is Jesus Christ. Man, I want Jesus. Man, I want to repent. Man, that sermon was deep. But then what happens as you walk out? What happens when the music turns off? What happens when you walk out of that door? You go back to your normal life. <laughs> you go back to who you were. You go back to your sins. And then you wait for the next Sabbath, or you wait for the next church service, and then you, get, you become holy again. Now the question today is, who do you say that I am? Let's pray. Father God who art in heaven, uh, we come before the throne of mercy at this moment in time as chief sinners of God. We uh, thank you for everything you've done for us. We thank you for the small things. We thank you for the big things. At this moment in time, God, as I'm about to preach, I pray that may you send your Holy Spirit upon me. Let it not be me who's preaching, but let it be you talking through me, God. May I be reduced to my lowest terms and may you increase. The worst part of this is the fact that even I haven't perfected who you really are, God. I pray that may you touch me before you touch the lives of others. I pray all this in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
I'd like to take this opportunity and greet you all in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen? amen. I didn't hear the amen. <laughs> Maybe let me try again. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Neighbor. <laughs> neighbor. 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 Jesus loves you. Now that's what I'm talking about. Now friends, today I'd like us to look at um, a text in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 8, verse 27. It says that Jesus, Jesus and his disciples went on to the village around Caesarea of Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say you are John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter, Peter answered and said, you're the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Now, friends, here we see a scenario whereby Jesus and his disciples were walking, right? So they come to this region called the Caesarea of Philippi. Now, this was in the border of uh, Canaan, and this was a, a place well-known for pagan origin. And then out of nowhere, Jesus turns to them and says, Who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? And uh, we, we, Jesus probably chose this particular place because this was a solitary place and there weren't many crowds flocking after him. So when he turns and says, who do you say people, who do people say that I am? I can imagine all the disciples, they, get, they got excited and everyone wanted to answer. One of them said, hey, some say you're John the Baptist. And friends, I understand why they called him John the Baptist because you see, uh, there was this uh, false belief by the Israelites that John, if, if you died as a martyr, you would repent first before the others. So they thought that Jesus was the resurrected John the Baptist. Now some others, others say he, he's Jeremiah. Now Jeremiah was known to be the weeping prophet. And uh, Jesus was often weeping because of our sins. So I understand why they made this connection. Like, oh, maybe this is Jeremiah. And uh, others say he, he's just one of the prophets. And others said he's Elijah, and we realize that Elijah did a lot of miracles, and uh, we see that Jesus, during his walk here on earth, he did a lot of miracles too. So I understand the connection why the people were saying that uh, Jesus is Elijah. But the thing is, what we have to understand here is that the people who were asked, or the people Jesus was asking about, are not the Pharisees, nor the Sadducees, no, the scribes, because they were already prejudiced against him. They called him a demon and uh, a member of the, the, the Babel uh, sort, of demon, sort of demon sanctity that they believed in during those times. So when they asked his, his disciples, he was asking about the ordinary people. Who do the ordinary people say I am? Who do the people that are looked down upon by the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, what do they say I am? And I understand why, because Jesus was often teaching and the disciples got uh, the chance to be able to interact with these people more often than Jesus did. So these are, these are followers of Jesus, and these people had been following Jesus for like three years now. And when, when they talked to the disciples, they said all of these things, and they, they looked high on Jesus. I mean, they called him a prophet. They called him John the Baptist. They called him all these uh, high people that they knew about. But although their perceptions were good, although they looked up on Jesus, although they looked up on Jesus, that doesn't mean that what they thought about Jesus was right. So in other words, does that mean that we, although we might be following Jesus, although we might be uh, going to church every day, although we might do all this stuff, right, and we sing, we do all these things, but does that mean that we know who Jesus is? Now, friends, we see here an, a, a, a scenario where all, all these people are saying all these sort of things, and then uh, Jesus refocuses the question. He, he, he changes the question. He takes it from the people, the other people who he was asking about, the general people, the ordinary people. He takes it to the disciples, and then he asks the disciples themselves, who do you say that I am? And that's the same question that Jesus is asking us today. Who do you say that I am? You saw the video earlier on. Uh, a couple of my friends were interviewed. And we, we, see, we, we saw a variation of what they had to say about me. Some said I'm a crazy South African. And uh, 
David spoke about the village and African hospitality and stuff. Now, what we have to realize is that if we have different variations, there will always be variations in perception, but there's only one truth. When David Ashik puts it, he says that uh, you can uh, think that you know Jesus, but actually have no clue about Jesus. Now, friends, we, we, the thing is, some of us might have grown up maybe in the Adventist church. Some of us might have grown up maybe in the Christian church. We went to Pathfinders. We went to Ad Adventist academies. We did all these things. So we, we, we grew up knowing about Jesus. We grew up being taught about the Bible. We grew up uh, being told that Jesus is this wonderful guy and we should, go to the, uh, we should go to church and we should keep our commandments. So we grew up under the Pathfinder Jesus. We grew up under our parents' Jesus. We grew up under our, our family's Jesus. We, we, we grew up under our church's Jesus. Oh, uh, why don't you drink? Oh, I don't drink because my pastor says that Jesus said I should not drink. So every time, you re every time you reference Jesus, you go back to your parents. Every time you reference Jesus, you go back to your youth leader. Every time you reference Jesus, you go back to your pastor. But now... Jesus is not asking today, who does your pastor say that I am? Jesus is not asking today, who, who do your parents say that I am? Jesus is not asking today, what does your church think I am? What's the doctrine that your church believes that I am? He's asking, who do you say that I am? It's a personal, individual question which is asked to each and every one of us today. I'd like us to go back to our story and uh, look at the book of Mark again. Chapter 8, verse 29, it says, uh, But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Now, friends, we see here that uh, when Jesus asked, what do people say that I am? Everyone, was, everyone wanted, was anxious and everyone wanted to answer the question. But then when, when Jesus now asks, what about you? I mean, you guys should know better, right? You've been in the church for five years. I mean, you are born in the church, if there's anything like that. You are born a Christian, right? So who, who do you say that I am? And I, I can imagine there was silence among the, the disciples, and then the bold Peter stands up and says, you are Christ. You are Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and, and Peter got it right. You are Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus turns to Peter and said, Blessed art thou, blessed art thou, Simon by John. Blessed art thou, Simon by John. Because he had got it right. Jesus was Christ. But look at what other people had to say about Jesus. They called him a ghost. Moses was dead. I mean, uh, Jeremiah was dead. Elijah was dead. And th that's, that's the perception that they had of Jesus. But then when, when, when Peter answers in... Uh, in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, he says that you are Christ, the Son of the living God. Is your perception of Jesus a dead perception? Is Jesus dead in your life or is Jesus alive in your life? Is, is Jesus just another person you have to see every Saturday in your life or every Sunday when you go to church? Or is Christ the living God in your life too? Now, friends, many of you may say, oh, uh, who, who, you're telling us about Jesus, and uh, you're asking us this, this question, who, who do you say I am? And Jesus is asking this question, who do you say I am? What about you? Do you even know this Jesus you're talking about? Who is Jesus in your life? What has Jesus done in your life? Maybe to walk you through in the small time that we have, uh, my name is uh, Wandi Lemtia, and, and I'm from South Africa. Uh, I grew up in a family which was not necessarily Adventist, but we prayed every day at least three times a day. And uh, growing up in this praying family, I, I, was, I was born naughty. I was like the naughtiest kid ever. I remember at the age of six, there was this huge uh, event. That was there was this huge event from uh, my cousin place, and we all were invited. And uh, as I was there, uh, there was this huge pot where they put all the alcohol in it. So all the elderly people are talking and laughing and drunk and everything. And I went up and, and started drinking the alcohol from it. <laughs> I started drinking the alcohol from it. And then 
The next thing, they saw me putting, throwing plates in the fire, doing all sorts of things. So, like, my, my parents knew that I was naughty. They were always called at the office. They were always coming to, to meetings at school. Some, almost every week, I had something going on. But then I remember at uh, the fourth grade, I, I, I thought to myself, I'm like, okay, I've been doing all these things. My teachers hate me. The principal knows me and hates me. I think, it's about to t I think it's about time I change. So I was like, okay, you know what? My mother always tells me about this Jesus. He's always, uh, we're always praying every morning. We go to church and we do, I go to Sunday school and all this stuff. So maybe let me try this Jesus and see uh, what he can do and, and what he can help me with. And since I was a naughty kid, we all know that naughty kids don't do well in school. So I was terrible in school. So I'm like, okay, you know what, God? I want to pass and I want to start doing well in school. And I started studying and, and started reading and, and, and all this sort of stuff, stuff that I had never done in my life before, at fourth grade. And as time progressed, the teachers were amazed. I was doing the projects and I was writing tests, I was showing up for class, and they were surprised. And I remember coming to my parents at, uh, I think, seventh grade and telling them, hey, listen, guys, I want to go to, to Solusi Adventist High School uh, so that I can learn about God, at the same time, learn more about school and stuff. And then I want to go to Andrews University and study architecture. And, and they turned to me and said, wait a minute, you want to go study architecture at Andrews? You want to go to this school? And it wasn't even in South Africa, it was in another country that I had looked up online and I wanted to go there. And <laughs> they said, where are we going to get the money to, to send you there? And then I turned to them and said, aren't you the guys who taught me about faith? Aren't you the guys who taught me about Jesus? Jesus will provide. And friends, I tell you, two weeks before I had to go to that school, Jesus provided. I finished my high school there, and towards my high school, finishing my high school there, just to shorten the story up, I, uh, I still wanted to come to Andrews, and so I was like, okay, Jesus, listen, man, I want to come to Andrews, and I'm still trying to discover you, because the only way you can know Jesus, the only way you can discover Jesus is through experience. And I, I asked Jesus, I'm like, man, sh show yourself to me. I, I don't have the money to go to college. I don't have the money to go to Andrews University. It's in another country, different currency, so difficult, and I have to go through some immigration stuff. So I remember Jesus, say, Jesus told me, like, listen, man, study hard and do well, and you shall see the wonders that I will do for you. So I remember I was the only one in high school to do 18 classes, but we call them subjects, with Cambridge University in England. And uh, I did well with all of them, and that, uh, that, that, that attracted a lot of media and a lot of scholarships. I got a scholarship to a prestigious school called Durban University of Technology. And when I was there, I was studying architecture there, my first year there, which was two years ago, and I said, Jesus, man, this is great. I did well in school. I'm in Durban, and I'm studying architecture, but this is not where I want to be. I've always wanted to come to Andrews and uh, learn more about you at the same time, learn my trade of school. And then I prayed, I'm like, Jesus, show yourself to me again. And then Jesus showed himself to me. He said, listen, keep studying here and apply for next year to Andrews University. I didn't have the money, I had a full ride, but uh, I was willing to, to give away my full ride just to come to a school where I did not even have a ride. <laughs> <laughs> so since I didn't have a ride, I started praying about the ride, and like, God, how am I going to get to Andrews? And um, I remember I got an email uh, a couple of months down the line. I got an email from the American Embassy. They said, okay, listen, we're going to pay for your uh, visa, the air flight, and everything, and we'll give you $2,000 allowance. I was like, man, Jesus already answering me. And uh, after that, I, I, so I had everything sorted out. I was ready to come here, but I didn't have the tuition. I'm like, okay, Jesus, listen, man, you got me the ride. Thank you. But I need the tuition now. And uh, I remember I, I, I was trying different companies and trying different things and praying at the same time. I walked into to one office, and apparently the mayor was there. And after talking to the mayor, they gave me 150,000 rands to come and start off school here. Has that happened to you? 
It doesn't happen. And then the mayor told me, he's like, you are the only person that the government has ever, a single person that the government has ever funded with so much, so much amount of money. And, and, and I was thankful. I was like, man, Jesus has showed himself to me. And I got here. I'm excited. 150,000 in rands, South African currency. And when we converted it to US dollars, it was just sufficient for one semester. I was like, man, Jesus is playing games with me again. <laughs> like, okay, uh, listen, Jesus, the thing is, this is great. I'm here, I'm going to learn for a semester, but I don't want to go back home. So uh, come up with another plan. I think I, I, I need you to, 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 to sustain me and uh, keep me in school. And I remember towards the end of first semester last spring, I was starting to stress up and uh, still trying to uh, pull a couple of strings so as to... Uh, so I had to pay this amount for the next semester. And I remember two, two weeks just before the close of spring semester, I, uh, I, uh, I, I won the Freshman Architecture Award, and then two days down the line, I got an email from the provost, I've never met her before, but I got an email from the provost telling me that I'd received the Dare to Dream Scholarship, amen? amen. And part of the email said that, oh, this is a rare scholarship uh, given to two or three students at, at Andrews University every year who are going to be ambassadors of Andrews, and it is till you finish your master's. <laughs> and then I looked up. I remember I was with uh, Jonathan, Charlie, and Robel when I told them we all got excited, we prayed, and, and, and then that's when I had finally discovered Jesus. And I turned to him and said, man, listen, you have showed me that you can lead me in everything. Take over my life. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, the question is, who do you say I am? And most of you are saying, okay, well, you have told us about your story. I mean, I grew up here, grew up in Adventist academies. I always had the money to go to school. And Jesus hasn't done anything wonderful in my life. Who is this Jesus? I still don't get it. You can't relate to me in these terms. But the fact that you always had everything you wanted is an even greater testimony than what I have. Now, the fact that you always grew up in church and you can easily walk into a public high school and tell them that you have never smoked before, that's an outstanding testimony to those kids. If you can walk to... I'm under no illusion that maybe you might have done that. Amen? <laughs> but if you can walk to... Uh, walk to a secular university and tell them that you, you, you've never drank before, they, they, they'll be shocked. They'll be like, are you human or something? They won't believe you. Now, that is even greater testimony. That shows that Jesus has been in your life up until this far. But the big question is, do you know who this Jesus is? Who do you say that I am? Your church says that Jesus is love, you read your Bible, it says that, well, God is love. But the thing is, what do you say he is? Who do you say that he is? Now, friends, maybe let me introduce to you the Jesus that I know. You know, you know most people's biographies are written towards the end of their lives or just before they die. Or after they are dead, their biographies are written. But what I'm saying is that Jesus' biography was written before he was born. You know, when Jesus was born, he was born in a city called Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem uh, in Hebrew means the house of bread. 33 years later, when Jesus died, he called himself the bread of life. You see, uh, when Jesus was born, there was a huge crowd in Jerusalem. They had all flocked to Jerusalem for uh, the census, which is there by Julius Caesar. 33 years later, when Jesus died, there was a huge crowd in Jerusalem which had come for the Passover. You see, when Jesus was born, blood and water oozed out, just like every child. When, when any child is born, blood and water comes out. But then 33 years later, when Jesus died, someone thrust a spear on his side and blood and water oozed out, showing that a new creation was being made, and that's the church of Christ, and that is us today. Are these all coincidences? Maybe let's look at more. When Jesus was born, his mother Mary was there. And 33 years later, when Jesus died, another Mary was there to anoint him with oil in the tomb. 
Some still say, hey, man, I still don't get this Jesus. Who is this Jesus? I mean, I get cool story, bro, <laughs> testimony, and uh, Jesus similarities and all the Bible, but who is Jesus? You know, some of you who might have taken maybe uh, marketing, for example, there's a concept in marketing called JIT, just in time. And it is used by a company, or introduced, it was introduced by a company called Toyota. So what happens in Toyota is this. In the morning, uh, when people come in, there will be no stock. At, in the evening, there's no stock. During the night, there's no stock. So the, the stock would come in during the day, KDTs, and they will all be assembled at the same time, and a thousand cars might be sold that day. But in the evening, the whole company will be empty and there will be no stock. The stock comes just in time. And everything is done just in time, and it is sold just in time. Now, the Jesus that I know, he's always just in time. He's never too early, and he's never too late. Now, friends, there's another concept in, uh, in marketing as well. It's called the Kaizen. Now, Kaizen is a, is, a, is a Japanese term which means continuous improvement. Now, Kaizen was introduced by a company called Nissan. Anyone who drives the Nissan here? No? Okay, you guys don't know the real cars. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, when Nissan introduced uh, the concept of Kaizen, this is what happens. The engineers would, uh, would form these cars, and they would engineer and craft these cars nicely. And the cars are put out there for critique. They call everyone, the person who cleans the toilet, the person who sweeps the floors, everyone comes in, and they look at these cars, and they critique these cars. And then they, when, when they are done critiquing these cars, everything is changed. And, and, and everything that is changed, and then the cars are sold. Now, friends, the Jesus that I know, once you meet him, you don't remain the same. There will always be continuous improvement in your life. Amen? You know, you can claim, you can profess to know Jesus and not possess him. But you cannot possess Jesus and not profess him. Maybe in conclusion, there's also another concept in marketing again. I'm architecture, by the way. There's also another uh, concept in marketing. It's called the product life cycle. How many of you remember the Nokia? Yeah. These are the first phones. How many of you remember the Nokia 3310? You remember playing that snake? <laughs> well, this is my old Nokia. I've got it here. But then I think it's too old. Let me just put it back. How many of you remember the BlackBerry? Now here I've got the BlackBerry Touch. Uh, it slides. There's camera. You can, uh, there's also an app called the BBM. You can only talk to people who have Blackberries. And uh, <laughs> you can take videos with this. You can call. You can do everything you want. It's the greatest phone ever. How many of you have a BlackBerry here? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, there's this thing called a product life cycle. This, this, this is how it works. So um, a product is introduced, right? And then it grows. It reaches a stage of uh, maturity. And then it starts to saturate. And then it declines. Now, the BlackBerry was introduced. There was an app called BBM. Everyone wanted to put their hands on this. Everyone wanted the BlackBerry. And when the BlackBerry was introduced, uh, very few people had it because it was super expensive. And then it grew. As it grew, more people started uh, accumulating or maybe buying Blackberries because the price was slowly going down. And then the BlackBerry reached the stage of growth and of maturity, actually. And everyone had a BlackBerry. Everyone was on BBM. <laughs> and then another phone was introduced. Do you know what phone that is? <laughs> the iPhone. <laughs> How many of you have iPhones here? <laughs> Almost everyone has an iPhone. <laughs> I have a BlackBerry. <laughs> well, the iPhone was introduced. So that means that the BlackBerry was reaching a stage of saturation. And then it's declined. Now, imagine if I had dropped an iPhone 5C. Everyone was going to scream. <laughs> but I just dropped a BlackBerry. 
and everyone is chilled about it. <laughs> now, Jesus was introduced in the foundation of the earth. John 1 verse 1 said, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he was introduced in the creation of the earth. And then he reached the stage of growth during the times of Moses, the times of Elijah, the times of the prophets. He reached the stage of maturity when he was here on earth and got crucified. And then he started to go to the stage of saturation during the dark ages. But then since this is God... It was rejuvenated and it went up again during the time of uh, Martin Luther, during the time of the prophets Ellen White, during the time of the prophets just after the Dark Ages. And up until today, I'm standing in front of you presenting this Jesus. He never declines. He never gets saturated. But the main question is, who do you say that he is? A lot of you may be saying, well, Jesus' life uh, is love. I, I, gave, I gave my life to Jesus a couple of years ago, and uh, I got baptized, and it, it was great. But have you ever had your girlfriend come up to you and say, do you love me? And you're like, baby, I always tell you I love you. I told you yesterday. I told you last night. He's like, yes, you told me yesterday. You told me last night, but do you love me now? <laughs> and then you say yes. And then the next question is, who do you say that I am? What's my favorite color? Like uh, green, purple, blue? And that's the same question Jesus asks into you today. Who do you say that Jesus is? Try him. Amen.